What's happening, everybody? It's your man, Dame DMY. Mike's up. Back again, Monday night, brand new episode. And yeah, I'm excited, uh, you know, about tonight's conversation and tonight's guest, uh, who's going to be joining me on the mic tonight. Uh, you know, she and the organization that she's supporting are really doing some great work here in our community. Uh, and it, it should be highlighted, you know, and I'm myself, I'm very familiar with this subject. Because I do this as well. Uh, so it was great uh, for me when I was able to, to put this conversation together. Uh, but, you know, you guys are probably like, Dane, what are you teasing about? Like, what are you talking about? Sounds like I'm rambling here. Well, let me do you one better. I'm going to bring to the stage tonight, you know, on the other mic, uh, the Miss uh, Rachel Payne. Rachel, how are you doing this evening? Thank you for taking time out for joining us. How are you? Hi, Damon. I am doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's it's my pleasure. Uh, like I said, I get excited a lot of times when, when I have the opportunity to talk about something that I'm familiar with, but I think our community, a lot of a lot of times across our communities, we kind of overlook, uh, if you will, this segment of our, our of our community uh, that that really needs support and needs help. And when you know, I was able to reach out, and you guys were so so quick to really come on. I'm proud. I'm going to go ahead and step back for a minute. Rachel, please take a moment to introduce yourself so we can really dig into tonight's conversation. Okay. So good evening. My name is Rachel Payne and I am vice president of advocacy and public policy at Dit Lake. Dit Lake Incorporated is a 50 year old nonprofit, actually 57 year old nonprofit wow. based in Manassas, Virginia. And, um, but we're we're widespread and I can get into that a little bit more. But a little bit about me, I'm actually from Hampton Roads, Virginia. Um, I've lived in various places across the country, uh, thankful to my husband's military career. <laughs> so um, which actually really contributes to where I am today in my career. But uh, we made our way back to Virginia about 10 years ago with our kids. And we currently live in Northern Virginia right now. I have an employment background in the human services field working with individuals in job training programs and helping people who are seeking employment opportunities. So I actually began my career with Dit Lake 10 years ago in July. Um, it'll be 10 years. I was actually hired as the on-site job coach for a new project search program in Portsmouth, Virginia uh, at a hospital. And I actually had the pleasure of working with uh, young adults on the autism spectrum and uh, they were seeking employment opportunities and training. So I was really drawn to Dit Lake though because of its mission and my passion in helping people who want it to work. Um, I mentioned my husband's military career. I knew what my experience was trying to find employment as a military spouse. And ultimately that led me to the path of instead of becoming a clinical psychologist, I chose industrial organizational psychology because I wanted to really dig into employment and understanding how organizations work and how people can make the best out of their own employment and career journeys. So I didn't see myself necessarily working in the disability services field, but um, that's where I am. And I'm so happy I couldn't be, couldn't be happier to work with the individuals and the organization that I work for. I mean, Rachel, that that is so deep, right? Like to really wade into. But there were a couple of things that I did hear you talk about that I think is really important and critical uh, that people really, really understand. One, um, the mission and vision of Dead Lake, right? I, and I think that's really key. I think that's a, a good place to start. Um, what would you say is really the overall you know, mission and vision of Dit Lake, you know, mm -hmm. across our country and, and communities that they serve. I'm so glad you asked that. So our mission is creating opportunities that enrich the lives of people with disabilities. And we envision inclusive communities in which people with disabilities are valued and respected and where everyone has the opportunity to make choices and participate in all aspects of society. So really, you know, when you go back to the 
origination of the organization started out as a small school. So back in the 60s, before it was federally mandated that uh, public schools had to provide free and appropriate education for all students. There's a small group of families in Manassas that said, you know, we want our children to be educated. We want them to have the same opportunities that all other kids have to learn. So they started a small school in Manassas, Virginia, tiny old Manassas, Virginia at the time. And um, they started teaching their kids. And then, you know, you go forward almost 60 years to now we really are, I think, working towards that that vision of having inclusive communities. And part of that is really even the opportunity that you're giving me this evening to speak to people to talk about what we do and why people with disabilities are so important to our communities, why it's so important to ensure that people are included and not uh, overlooked when it comes to participation, engagement in their communities, employment, and, and all again, all aspects of, of society that everyone wants to enjoy. You know, I, I I love that, you know, those aspects that you're talking about, you know, it's really important and critical, um, you know, but Didlake also has some other programs that have been designed and developed, you know, throughout, you know, throughout the you know, evolution, if you will. And, you know, I read some of them and I just want, if you could, just really touch on a couple of programs uh, that are provided by Didlake, you know, to those in our community that, that are looking for that or need that type of assistance? Yeah, so at the heart of who we are, we're a rehab services organization. So we provide rehabilitation services in a few different ways. The one that's near and dear to my heart is employment services because that's actually how I started out with Ditlake again as an employment specialist. So our programs focus on community, community integration and employment. Uh, we offer a variety of options to individuals with disabilities. Specifically, we work with adults with disabilities, but we also work with transitioning youth in high school also. And so we have um, our employment services program, which um, we connect individuals who are looking for employment um, with businesses that are hiring and support them on their employment journey. And so we have, um, you know, we work with DARS, uh, D Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services in Virginia, and we have job coaches that provide the services, and we break those down into uh, four core services, and people can read about that on our website, and we have a lot of really good information, and they can also reach out to us, which I'll give that information at the end, but we've worked with hundreds of Virginia businesses to create those opportunities and have connected over 4,000 people with jobs in the community over the last 10 years alone. Um, like I mentioned, we have employment specialists who are also called job coaches, and they work closely with individuals who are looking for employment to um, see what they're interested in, assess their skills, uh, determine what types of supports they're going to need in the workplace so that they can be the, as successful and independent as possible, including reasonable accommodations that they can then speak with the employer about as well to ensure that everyone has what they need to be successful in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, we also partner with companies to offer something called situational assessments for our clients. And this allows individuals to learn about the job and try different aspects of a job to assess their interests and determine, again, what types of supports they might need once they get a job. And um, our employment specialists also help you know, our clients integrate into the workplace. So that's a little bit about our employment services. Also, you know, we have five day support programs. So that's another component of the rehab services that we provide. And those are uh, those programs offer individuals the opportunity to improve their independent living skills and engage with the community. So each site, each of those five programs are really unique and they offer uh, different services customized to meet the needs of the individual participants. And one of the things that we're super proud about when it comes to our day support programs is the amount of volunteerism that they do. So I think that many times people have this preconceived notion of what day support might be. And in our training that we give new hires, we ask them, what do you think that is? And people will toss out all kinds of answers and <laughs> they may say, oh, is it like adult daycare? And we're like, no, no. that's yeah. not what Ditlake's day support programs are about. So like I mentioned, volunteerism is really, really big for our day support for, um, program participants. They have volunteered over 32,000 hours at a variety wow. of nonprofits throughout Virginia. 
So just Virginia. And over, over many, many years, we've partnered with over 20 local nonprofits to offer those volunteer opportunities that match the different interests of our program participants. So they get to choose what they want to do. We have some people who love gardening, so they will volunteer at uh, a local nonprofit in Woodbridge. Mm -hmm and doing beautification and gardening there. We have individuals that have lots of different variety of, of interests. So we wanna make sure that we're meeting their needs and we're not just choosing for them. We're creating those opportunities, but they get to choose what they do and how they wanna participate. So that's something else that's just really cool to me. And they, they go out, explore community resources. The whole goal is to help them develop those independence mm -hmm. so that they can really integrate and Great. be a part of you know, I love it. I, I can see the, the passion. I can hear the passion. I see it on your face. I, I mean, I love it. And I, that's why I didn't want to interrupt you because I, I think this is important because, I mean, I, I'm familiar. I, I also work in a space and I, I work for a company similar uh, to what you do in, in helping people with disabilities, you know, so I, I understand it and I, I love I love to hear it. But I do want to talk from your from your perspective because we, we did go through this pandemic. Yes. You know, what what was that like and what has it been like now that we seem to be coming out, if you will, on the other side where we're, we're getting back to some type of normalcy. But what was it like for Did Lake and, and you and your role uh, mm -hmm. during that pandemic time to try to kind of keep I don't want to say keep things afloat, but kind of keep people integrated? Because really what, what you're doing is, is keeping people integrated and, and engaged, yeah. if you will, it, with services and things. So what was that like for you during that time? Oh, that was a challenging time. I mean, as you can imagine for everyone, but particularly for the work that we do, we're already working with uh, a vulnerable population of individuals, wow. some with you know, varying disabilities that impact their emotional well-being, their mental health. And so one of the things that we wanted to ensure, especially when it came to our rehab services, was that we still kept our participants engaged and we were still connected with them in any way that we could because through the, the mandates, we did have to close our day support programs. On the other side, we had employees because we're also an employer. We're also one of the largest employers of people with disabilities in Virginia. And so for our employees who work for the federal government on our contracts, they still had to work. They were essential workers. So we were doing everything we could do to help support them, but at the same time supporting our participants in our, our day support programs. And it was really hard because we had to come up with plans. And for me, being on the executive team and doing the work that I do around advocacy and government affairs, I led a lot of the charge when it came to figuring out what resources were out there, bringing that back to the team, coming up with a, a really comprehensive plan, which we were really proud of because we were one of the first organizations that brought our people back and reopened our programs. Everyone else, they were scared and we, we understood, but we, I, I guess you could say we feared more of what would happen if our participants stayed at home and lost that engagement, as well as our employees, our direct support professionals who work those programs. We wanted to make sure that they could get back to work safely. So we came up with very specific protocols um, in line and over and above what the state required us to do. And we had weekly meetings to prepare. We prepared our participants, their families, our funding sources for what we were going to do. So it was a lot of communication and, and we made a decision ultimately was that we just wanted to make sure that we could, could bring back some level or sense of normalcy for ourselves as an organization, but most of all for the people that we serve. Hmm. And, and I'm curious, like, so how, how has it been? Like, how has the response been, if you will? Cause I, I know, like you said, the, those who were, you know, deemed critical or necessary, you know, because I, again, I went through the same thing, but how, how has that been? Because I, I know for me, I, I had some experiences and some challenges when, you know, kind of reintegrating, you know, reintegrating, you know, people back uh, to certain locations, or sometimes you had to, you know, move people um, mm -hmm. to new locations. And that could be a challenge. And that, that's something that is not seen on the backside, you know, for some. Um, and how, how was that? Did you face any challenges like that? Or did any counselors or anything have to maybe get more involved in if you did have those, you know, life changes, I call them, because sometimes for the, you know, that community, it can be a life change when you move them from one location that maybe they've been there. Who knows? I mean, I know a few of mine, you know, they were at one location for 10 years. Uh, it was almost like a second home. Uh, but then coming out, transitioning back out, 
had to kind of re reintegrate them to a new site. Mm -hmm. And that, from what I heard, was a new challenge. So, like for you, like have you or your staff had to deal with anything like that? And how do you kind of go about kind of helping someone in that type of situation? So for our program participants, not so much, but because we wanted to ensure that everyone was as safe as possible, we did have to make some adjustments to how we ran our programs. So that did impact people in terms of maybe they couldn't go to some of the locations or volunteer where they normally would. So that was an adjustment. We communicated the best that we could to our participants and to their families, again, to the fund our funding sources and to group homes if anyone lived in a group home and let them know what to expect this is what we're going to do things are going are going to be a little bit different but this is how we're going to continue to support people i think if anything some of the changes that we did have to make to maintain the really low ratios that we wanted to maintain for safety and to keep people you know we talk about during the height of COVID where we had our pods, right? Mm -hmm. We had our group of people that, that we hung out with that we wanted to make sure that we could still have that social connection, but be as safe as possible and reduce and mitigate those risks of, of getting COVID or getting sick. So we did the same thing. So that was a challenge in and of itself to ensure that we could keep the same staff and participants together every single day that they came to the programs. So I think that sometimes we did have staff from one program go to another because maybe we had more participants participating in that program and we needed more staff. Mm -hmm. So our staff were amazing. I cannot say enough. I wanna give a plug and a shout out to all direct support professionals, DSPs out there because they do a lot of work. I was a direct support professional in a couple different jobs and they don't always get the recognition that they deserve because, you know, executive staff, the powers to be, as people say sometimes, you know, we make decisions, but they're the ones that are out there in the field. They're working day in and day out, keeping people safe. So the challenges were really uh, many that they faced and we were there to support them, keep mm -hmm. the communication open um, and, and making sure that they could do the work that they could do and keeping everyone safe. So there were changes, there were things that we had to do differently, but we, pride ourselves, honestly, in being able to continue to provide services for people. And not so much that it looked, not about what it looked like for us as an organization, but that we could continue to meet our mission and work towards that vision. I, I love that you said that, because that, that's important. Uh, you know, the, the front line, you know, overworked sometimes, mm -hmm. underpaid, but they're the ones out there, you know, really getting it done. Uh, and it is important. And you're right, you know, by giving them a shout out, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Sometimes, you know, we have our, our senior level uh, leadership. <clears throat> Sometimes they're sitting in a different office on a different hill with a different set of glasses on. And it may, that's just how it works. Uh, but those who are in the trenches every day, they are the true heroes, the true people that are out there that are making it happen and really making the organization run. So I, I concur and I agree with you. And I think that was great to, to give them a moment of shine. And, you know, we want to go ahead and continue to support them so they can keep continuing, you know, supporting the program participants and, and everyone else in the community. So it's really key. Uh, with that said, though, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and take a pause for the cause. We'll be right back after this short commercial break. And we're going to ask Rachel uh, a, a few more questions. We're going to try to get into her actual role and what it's like uh, a day in the life of Rachel Payne, you know, doing her job. Because these are some things, you know, we like to know when we get some C-suite executives and people out here really putting in the work. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after this short pause for the cause. Don't go anywhere.
All right, everybody, we back fresh out the break, sitting here with Rachel Payne. You know, she has really educated us tonight on, you know, everything that goes on with serving our community, people uh, with disabilities, the reintegration process. You know, we talked about her company, Did Lake, and it's amazing history. But now we want to get a little personal. We're going to take a minute. Yeah, we're going to get a little more personal here, Rachel. You know, I, I always like to really have have or give people an opportunity to kind of see because you know we have different type of guests on here you know c-suites you know celebrity guests but i think it's always important that you know when people watch this or listen to this that they really get an understanding of what a day in your life is like you know public policy and all of these other things that you probably you probably wear more hats than than just your job title Mm -hmm. so right, right exactly so if you could just take a minute or two, like kind of give us or walk us through, you know, what a day for Rachel Payne might look like at Diddley. Oh, okay. <laughs> so exactly what you said, it's more than just my title. So yes, my title is Vice President of Advocacy and Public Policy. But uh, so in addition to advocacy efforts and and public policy efforts that I oversee and I work day in and day out, I also oversee training and development. And I also oversee Dit Lake's Autism Center of Excellence. So we're a nonprofit, and oftentimes um, nonprofits, people wear many hats. So I'm one of those people that has the pleasure to wear a few different hats, but I, I actually really love it. And so I am pretty much a team of one, but I have a lot of people around me when it comes to the public policy piece. And, you know, I, I see help and assistance from our corporate counsel, from human resources. As you can imagine, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just straightforward. I work with a lot of colleagues out in the community as well from other nonprofits that do similar work. So that's that's the cool thing about that. Training and development is very, for us, very mission oriented, something that is very important to me, workforce development, training and development. So several years ago, I took that on and I do have a director and she has uh, another training specialist and an admin. So they're doing that work. I'm there to guide them and facilitate them when it comes to our strategic direction. And again, our, our Dit Lake Autism Center of Excellence is something that I stood up several years ago when Dit Lake decided that you know we really wanted to bring back something that we had many years ago. At the time, it was geared around really supporting and serving consumers with autism spectrum. As the rates continue to climb, more and more individuals are being diagnosed every year. So we that went away for a little bit. I was asked to bring that back. So I stood that back up and developed that. And when I moved on to my current role as, as VP many years ago, I handed over the reins to someone else who's doing that. But again, I, I work with her closely to, to guide that strategic direction. So Day in and day out, it changes, changes depending on what's going on. Uh, the debt ceiling. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that, a huge that impact. Was, that was an impact because mm-hmm. we're we're also a federal contractor. So mm-hmm. anytime there's anything going on with the budget funding, we always have to have our, you know have our eyes opened, uh, ensuring that we know what's going on with our contracts. Um, and if there's going to be a government shutdown, what's going to be impacted. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, everything went through for now, but uh, we were on guard. I was on guard, making sure I'm checking the news and following what's going on. Even at, at this point, I didn't have to, but when we face other potential government shutdowns, that means I'm writing letters, mm-hmm. phone calls, I am letting our elected officials know the impacts that this could have on the people that we serve, our employees as a whole. And some of our contracts are fully funded. Some of them are not. So, and if people aren't getting paid because the contract is not fully funded, they're oftentimes still expected to come to work because they're essential personnel. So, you know, that's a tough one. And Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm always there. I'm always working uh, with others in the organization as well as other colleagues doing government affairs work and advocacy work out in the community to to advocate for the work that you know we do to support people and ensuring that people with disabilities are not left behind. 
Mm. You know, the legislative process across all levels really can be challenging, can be yep. very challenging at, at times. And there are competing priorities for funding and for passing legislation. And many times the disability services are underfunded or bills don't get enough traction. And so in my role, I'm always looking for ways to uh, raise a, awareness of issues that are impacting people with mm -hmm. and advocate for the legislation that fosters a more inclusive and accessible workforce and community. So I, I'm really striving and working hard day in and day out to engage those elected officials on all levels, mm -hmm. local, state, federal, and organizations across the country so we can really come together and urge those elected officials to consider the needs of people with disabilities when they're discussing new legislation and proposed amendments. As that's that's really the key. And I think that's the most important part. I think, you know, I want people to walk away with the level, uh, the height that you're really working at to really continue these programs, you know, for, you know, this community. Like I said, many of us, we walk by, we have no idea what's going on, you know, and it's overlooked. And I, I just think it was important uh, to talk about this today. It was it's been a great conversation. I really have been educated. I mean, like I've been doing this, you know, for, for almost 12 years now. Uh, so to have someone else talk about it <laughs> is great. Uh, it's enlightening. But before we go, I want to I want to allow you to do two things. Okay. If you, you know, we have about two minutes. If you could just take a minute, one. Let our listeners and our audience know how can they get involved to help support VidLake and its mission. And please say, share any social media information that you like. And we'll make sure we put it down in the show notes and we'll share it with our audience as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Damon. So I'll take it, you know, really quickly. I do want to say that, you know, our culture does have a blind spot toward people with disabilities because they may understand or interact with the world differently. I do say that, you know, disability is a natural part of the human condition. We are all really just one day away. It can happen to any one of us. And so there's a lot that has happened over many, many decades, years and years and years, but there's still a lot more work that can be done. So, you know, thanks for asking how people can help. We, people with disabilities represent a largely untapped pool of talent. So we want to encourage listeners and viewers to open the door of employment to people with disabilities in your businesses. If you're a business owner, make, help make those connections. If you're in Virginia or Maryland, uh, businesses can contact our employment services department and ask for more information about how to connect them with people who are seeking employment. We're also looking for businesses to host those situational assessments and they don't take very long and we can give them more information about that. And also we have some retail businesses. So companies and individuals, they can go paperless if they want to. That's a big thing now with our Ditlake document imaging or they can preserve memories with Ditlake photo imaging. And those are our commercial um, businesses that actually do provide employment opportunities as well for people with disabilities. And of course, donations are always welcome. And you can learn more about all of these ways to partner with us on the We Create Opportunities page on our website at ditlake.org. And you can find us online again at www.ditlake.org and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Ditlake Inc. Inc. So there you have it. We're going to make sure that we uh, add all of that information down to our show notes. We'll make sure that we share that with our audience. You know, Rachel, it's been such a pleasure, you know, to be able to sit down with you this evening and really just get to know you, get to know more about Didlake and all the tremendous work that it's doing out here in our community. Ladies and gentlemen, so that's a wrap on tonight's amazing conversation. I'm your humble host, Damon Cunningham, a.k.a. Dame DMYDC. This is Two Mics Up. Season 5, Mogul TV Global Network. We're still rolling along. And by the way, you know, this is the number one network for positive programming. So make sure you check it out. Two mics up every Monday night, 8 p.m. Stay tuned for more. And you know how we do it this time, ladies and gentlemen. May you all stay safe. Stay blessed. Mics out. <music>